Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. I know we're tired of hearing it. We're tired of dealing with it. Donald Trump is trying to steal the election. Donald Trump refuses to accept the results. The lawyer leading his legal assault, Rudy Giuliani, is a joke. And as usual, with Trump's egregious excesses, we've become numb to it all. Which works, of course, in Trump's favor as he carries on doing outrageous things and we just dismiss them or look away. But we can't look away. This is an unprecedented and ongoing assault on American democracy. We are way past court challenges, audits, recounts. It's now just the president of the United States calling up other members of the Republican Party and telling them to overturn the results. What would we call this if we saw it in another country? Trump rang the Speaker of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives in recent days, not once, but twice, in a bid to get him to overturn Joe Biden's win in the Keystone State. He previously pressured Republican lawmakers in Michigan and the Republican governor of Georgia to do the same. All of these lawmakers have resisted the president's re requests to undo his loss, to simply throw out millions of votes because he wants them to. But what if they hadn't resisted? And Trump, remember, is still trying right before our very eyes. Now let's see whether or not somebody has the courage, whether it's a legislator or legislatures, or whether it's a justice of the Supreme Court or a number of justices of the Supreme Court. Let's see if they have the courage to do what everybody in this country knows is right. And if somebody has the courage, I know who the next administration will be. We lack the language to describe what Donald Trump is doing right now. Is coup the right word? In The Atlantic, the writer Zeynep Tufeki points out that in Turkey, there are different words for different types of coups because Turkey has enough experience with government overthrows uh, that the language demands it. There are self-coups or auto-coups. There are memorandum coups and e-coups and there are postmodern or soft coups. Turkey actually has a name for what some might say Trump is trying to do right now. Stay in power after losing an election. A self-coup. But despite the self in that term, Donald Trump definitely isn't doing this alone. When surveyed by the Washington Post, only 27, 27 out of 249 Republicans in Congress, barely more than 10% of them, would acknowledge that Biden won. Pathetic. And now this guy, Congressman Alex Mooney, wants to condemn those 27 for it in a resolution. There isn't a budget. There isn't a COVID relief bill. Americans are unemployed. They're hungry. They're becoming infected with COVID and dying in record numbers. But sure, Mr. Moody, tie up the time of the chamber with this excrement. Tell me more about reaching across the aisle to work with Republicans like that, Scranton Joe. At the other end of the GOP spectrum today, Senator Pat Toomey told the Philadelphia Inquiry that it's completely unacceptable for the president to pressure Pennsylvania lawmakers to overturn that state's election result, becoming one of the few Republicans willing to speak out against Trump. Even the six conservatives on the Supreme Court declined today to hear Trump's attempt to throw out mail-in voting in Pennsylvania. Still... The future is bleak for the GOP, even after or if Trump exits the scene. Remember the 2016 runner-up in the Republican primary, Senator Ted Profiles in Courage Cruz? You remember him. He's the guy whose father and wife Trump attacked during the 2016 campaign. And yet he's all in on election fraud conspiracy theories. He's even offered uh, to argue in front of the Supreme Court to have Pennsylvania's 7 million votes wiped out. Shameful and disqualifying. Ted Cruz, you should never be taken seriously as a candidate for elected office again, let alone high office. Anything that requires you to put your hand on a Bible and say you'll protect and defend the Constitution, that's out. Check with your wife about a job at Goldman Sachs. Maybe they'll be hiring them. This comes as the Texas Attorney General is suing four battleground states in the United States Supreme Court to try to get their votes overturned, alleging Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin used the pandemic to make unlawful last-minute election changes. Officials in those states are calling it a baseless stunt. And I'd also call this a baseless stunt. But this is the kind of thing that spurs people to do the kind of crazy things that people that get people hurt.
the Arizona Republican Party is now calling on members to fight and die in service to Trump's election nonsense. No joke. That's what they tweeted. And this is part of how they're doing it. This is what we do. Who we are. Live for nothing. Or die for something. The Arizona GOP tweeted that. Now, I like a John J. Rambo reference more than your average American. Truly, I do. But imagine if a Muslim, or imagine if a member of Black Lives Matter had asked this, had asked if members of their organization were willing to fight and die to overthrow the United States government. You think violence would be laughed at then or encouraged? Yes, Donald Trump is not succeeding in his effort to overthrow the government. And yes, with only days to go until the Electoral College seals Biden's win, Trump won't succeed. But so what? That's irrelevant. Attempted robbery is still a crime. My view? It's time for the House to impeach Trump again for trying to overthrow democracy, for his blatant attack on democracy. Just one of the president's two phone calls to the Pennsylvania House Speaker, just one of them, is a hundred times worse than his phone call with the Ukrainian president, which did get him impeached just a year ago. So put what Trump is doing right now on his permanent record. Impeach him. Because historians will judge. Historians will look back on November and December 2020 as a moment when American democracy was under threat from within. Let history remember not just what the sitting impeached president did, but what the rest of us did in response. For more, let's turn now to former Republican Congressman Carlos Cabello of Florida, also with us historian Ruth ben Giat, author of the book Strongman, How They Rise, Why They Succeed, How They Fall. Uh, good evening to you both. Thanks for being here. Ruth, as the historian, let me start with you. What is your view on what we've seen, are still seeing, from Donald Trump and his Republican enablers? Historically speaking, how unprecedented is this? It, we are in uh, uncharted terrain. Um, it does correspond uh, it, to what you could call a self-coup, but I prefer to think of what's going on. I've called them end-stage follies, you know, crazy things that desperate leaders who won't give up power because they fear prosecution will do. But I think this is a shock event, and authoritarians love shock events, uh, jolts to the system that they, they, they perpetrate when they are about to, when they're in trouble or they're about to pass to a new stage of rule. And this is what we're seeing now. Uh, and when Trump is hiring and firing so many people to gather his loyalists around him, it's because the stakes of the crime are bigger, the stealing the election. Yeah, indeed, the stakes are very high. And Carlos, there are your Pat Toobies, your Brad Raffensburgers, your Mitt Romneys, but the Republicans willing to stand up to Trump are sadly in the minority, tiny minority. If Donald Trump is on his way out, if the Electoral College is only days away from putting its stamp on Joe Biden's win, why are so many Republicans still so afraid of telling Emperor Trump he has no clothes? Maddie, the greatest fear for any member of Congress these days is a primary challenge. And for Republicans, that means being attacked by Donald Trump. Uh, so a lot of these Republicans are simply uh, responding to their own political interest, but that's no excuse. Uh, in a democracy, a democracy is a market system, uh, just like any market, and good information, meaning the truth, is fundamental uh, for the health of all markets, including this democracy. And people in leadership must be able to express simple truths, like the fact that Donald Trump lost the presidential election. By the way, there's some simple truths after November uh, 2020 that are good for Republicans. Republicans gained seats in the House. That is true. That is undeniable. But you can't have one truth without the other. And right now, people are refusing yeah. to express a simple truth, and that's very toxic to democracy. 
It, it's worse than that, Carlos. It's not just that they're not uh, expressing a simple truth or not speaking out. They're actively uh, enabling uh, what is going on. Uh, you look at, for example, uh, Congressman Jody Heiss's Twitter feed. Uh, it's become a hub of rallying cries for Trump, baseless election fraud conspiracies. I mean, how do you respond to a member of Congress saying nonsense like this? That's a former colleague of yours. It's regrettable, and that's right. Some are, are not just staying quiet, but actually uh, propagating some of these falsehoods and lies and conspiracies and, and confusing uh, the American people. And I think Republican members of Congress should uh, take a lesson from all of these state legislators and Republican elections officials who the president has reached out to directly to try to influence and manipulate and who have refused to go along with his requests. These men and women uh, one day will be recognized for their courage because I will say, Mehdi, uh, maybe for, for us it wouldn't be very difficult, but for a lot of Americans, if the president of the United States calls them and makes a request of them, that's a big deal. And yes. all of these Republican elected officials in the states uh, and those uh, who are appointed to manage our elections have said, no, we're not going to cheat. We're not going to manipulate the results yeah. for your benefit, no. even though we are Republicans. These Americans will really help our country stop having this tribal mentality, which is doing so much harm. Yeah. But what a uh, Look, what Carlos, a, I agree with you, what, and I never. Uh, Ruth, one one moment. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna make one point to Carlos, which is, I never thought I would praise Brian Kemp, the governor of Georgia, who has his own awful record as a secretary of state in that state. But you're right. Without him, we might be in different a uh, different terrain. The problem is, Carlos, he's in a minority, a tiny minority, and that's where Ruth. I wanted to bring you back in and say you're an expert on autocracy, on authoritarianism. Can you still describe the Republican Party today, the Trump-led Republican Party? as Democrats, small d Democrats. No, and, and in fact, uh, th what we're seeing is the bearing of, of fruit of uh, Trump inculcating a culture of lawlessness for four years. And the GOP was already moving toward being a, an authoritarian party when Trump came along. That's partly why they responded so well to his, you know, he's, he talks about shooting someone on Fifth Avenue before he even got the uh, nomination. But he has inculcated this culture that is built on loyalty rather than expertise, um, about a kind of capo mentality and a lawless mentality. And all of this is coming home to roost now because no matter, uh, the history of authoritarianism says that when political elites make their deals with the leader, no matter what he says or does, even the yeah. most dire circumstances, they stick with him to the bitter end. And very sadly, that's what we're seeing right now. Uh, indeed, that is what we're seeing right now. And Carlos, I mentioned a moment ago that this should be a permanent stain on Trump's record. I think they should impeach him again. There's nothing stopping them. But isn't it also now a permanent stain on your party? History will remember the GOP as having gone almost fully anti-democratic and authoritarian in the year 2020. Well, Mehdi, I'll tell you the next big test for congressional Republicans, and really all Republicans, but especially those in a position of leadership, is the Electoral College vote next week. Technically, and according to our Constitution, the Electoral College elects the President of the United States. And maybe, hopefully, some Republicans have been waiting for that vote to state the simple truth, what we all know already and have known for a few weeks that Joe Biden won the election. But I really do think that if after the Electoral College vote, Republicans stay silent, or in some cases, as you pointed out, continue spreading this uh, disinformation, these falsehoods, they're really uh, going yeah. to start uh, uh, imperiling themselves and they could really face consequences in future elections. Because I'll tell you, I, I don't know about all voters in this country, but the rising generations of voters, people under 40, uh, they don't have very much tolerance for these uh, kinds of games. They don't have tolerance for these conspiracy theories and uh, this spreading of falsehood. So yeah. I'm very hopeful that after the Electoral College vote, we can really dispense with this whole debate about nothing. 
I'm not as hopeful as you, Carlos, but let me put the last <laughs> question to Ruth. What's the end game here for Trump? You're an expert on strong men, on, on wannabe strong men in Trump's case, and their psychology. Surely Trump knows it's over for him. So why is he carrying on like this again and again, just trying and failing? What's the end game? One of the maxims is that uh, once they come to office, it's extremely hard to get them out. Partly of the, is because uh, for a regular Democratic leader with small d, they think about their legacy if they're going to leave office. For someone like Trump, uh, who's become, who's addicted to the adulation and the control and the ability to humiliate others, leaving office is a kind of psychological annihilation. And that's why I'm pretty sure he's going to declare, whether, whether he actually runs in 2024, he's going to declare his candidacy because that allows him to keep control of the party, prevent charismatic others from emerging because he cannot brook any rivals. He has to be the top dog. And then he can continue his dog and pony show with his, uh, his rallies and his yes. you know, chants and the whole, the whole thing. And, and that's what he needs psychologically. Um, and that's what he really cares about, uh, making money for Trump organization, fleecing people. All of that can continue. So that, that might be the end game if he actually yeah. does leave. And meanwhile, uh, you know, if democracy burns to the ground in the process, so what to him, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Ruth Ben-Ghiat, former Congressman Carlos Cabello, thank you both for your time. We appreciate it.